Yeah, thank Hi. you so much for joining us. Um, feel free to give yourself an introduction and then get started. Okay, awesome. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Lamar. Hi. Yeah, I can see you guys and girls. Uh, I'm here at my factory. This is Adafruit, so I'm in Manhattan. So I'm a couple hundred miles away, but that's okay. I'm coming to you over the internet. I got some gigantic eyeballs on my desk, which is useful. Uh, and this is where I do my engineering. So I'm the CEO and founder and lead engineer. I do software and hardware engineering here, which means I spend half of my time blaming the other half of my time uh, for mistakes that I made. And uh, I design open source hardware. So I design bits and pieces of hardware that uh, students, engineers, uh, people who work in companies, people who are starting companies, people who are doing research. Um, for example, um, you maybe have heard about this uh, the Volkswagen diesel gate uh, scandal that happened a couple years ago where uh, cars were uh, emitting more emissions than they were supposed to. Uh, so researchers that did that research used some of the sensors that we developed here to uh, measure air quality and barometric pressure and, and GPSs and stuff like that. So um, I make a lot of really fun electronics here and I thought I'd give you a tour of Adafruit because this is my home and I, it's kind of neat. It's a little fantasy land of engineering joy. So yes, this is my desk and so I'm gonna come around here. And so this is the 10th floor of the factory and um, I've got a couple floors here. We're in Soho, which is kind of like southwestern um, Manhattan, the island of Manhattan. Um, this floor is the fabrication floor. This is where we do all of our testing and manufacturing. So um, one of the most important things I said, not just manufacturing, but testing. So for example, you know, I make, uh, let's see here. This is a little microcontroller dev board. Uh, we manufactured a bunch of these, I guess, a couple days ago. And um, this is the bin that holds all the panels. I'll show you, you know, how these panels are made shortly. But um, you know, these are panelized PCBs. So I've got you know, one design, but making one design at a time takes forever. Uh, so what you do is just panelize them. So it's like 10 by three, so you make 30 at a time. And then you break them off, which is really satisfying because they snap very nicely. And then we also design um, testers. So that's actually a really important part of what like, I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, not just design the hardware, but then designing the test fixtures and the test procedure, um, which is arguably harder because you know you can make something and it kind of works, but making sure that the thing you made works, even if you make hundreds of thousands of them, and it has to work, you know, they have to work every time, and you have to have like a hundred percent correctness. You can't have you know false positive or false negative uh, because in one way you end up sending customers bad hardware, and the other way you end up losing a ton of money because you're throwing away hardware. So, you know, I designed these test fixtures. So like this is a test fixture for that board and it's got this like really cool clamp and the board goes in here and it clamps down. And then this is um, a Raspberry Pi computer, which kind of does a bunch of uh, Linuxy test things and, and makes sure that the board is all good. Um, I actually kind of like the test procedure uh, development process because uh, I think it's fun to try to figure out what can go wrong with the design and then uh, test against it so I can make sure that that doesn't happen. But at the same time, you have to test as fast as possible. So if you can get your test procedure to be five or 10 seconds per board, uh, you know, the test procedure is what takes the most amount of time in manufacturing something usually. So it's really important to get that number as low as possible. So getting something from 30 seconds down to five seconds, you multiply that out by you know, 100,000 boards that you're manufacturing a year. Uh, that's like years of people, you know, days of people's lives out of the year. Uh, okay, so this is the manufacturing line. Uh, so, you know, they called a, a pick and place line a line because like it's linear, like they literally have machines one after the other. And, um, you know, you start with those panelized circuit boards. So this is a, a servo motor, motor shield for Arduino. So you put this on top of an Arduino, lets you drive stepper motors, DC motors, your favorite solenoids, what have you. Um, so we start with these and um, we also start with reels of components. So you have the circuit board that you design with your favorite CAD software and then you have chips. So this chip is uh, the, dim, the PWM driver chip, and then we also have the, the motor driver chip. And um, these come in reels because it's just a very handy way to transport thousands and thousands of chips. And then what you do is you load it into a feeder, which is a super cool thing. It looks like a, a gun from like Overwatch, but it's not. It's a thing that you put the reel over here, and then uh, I'm not going to do it because it would require eight hands, but um, you feed that the real, like it, it's, a, it's like a spool of parts. You feed it through here 
and it comes out and then it can like pop out like one chip at a time and it's like really effective and fast and it's like 100% like it always works out. Thank you kind assistant. So over here we actually have some feeders that I can uh, show you because they're already they're already loaded. Um, so when you're you know manufacturing stuff or you're designing stuff it's key to make sure you can get your parts on wheel. Sometimes especially if you're using rare parts they don't come on wheel and it's a real pain. Like you want to make sure that uh, your parts are reelable. Otherwise, you might have to hand place them, or they come on trays, and, and trays are very finicky. Um, but like, basically, if it comes on this, you know, this is this is really neat. It's it's mechanical, and it just advances, and then the the chips just kind of come out. So it's kind of cool. So we have you know everything on on feeders here, and I'll put this back on this feeder holder. And these are the stencils. So um, we also I'll show you the stencil in a moment. But let me see if I can pull one of these out. Tough. Oh, there you go. So this is a stencil. So when you manufacture the circuit boards, you know, I don't know if you guys have soldered, but uh, soldering is really, really slow because you have to like solder one point at a time. Uh, and that's not fast enough for us. We want to go fast, fast, fast. So we have a stencil. And as you can see, uh, there's holes in it. And those holes are like super precise made with a laser. And when I show you the stenciling machine, what it does is it squeegees out this conductive metal paste. It's like a um, metal in like a flux, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 suspension. And there's these little solder balls, and they uh, they're like really really small, like microscopic small. They get pushed through, and then they sit on the circuit board uh, in the precise pattern. It's like there's optical registration and stuff. And then when the pick and place puts the components from the feeder onto the uh, circuit board it kind of sticks in place because the paste is like tacky. So th these are uh, super cool stencils I'm gonna put this Back, okay, so let's actually look at the line itself. So this is the line uh, And it starts over here with the board loader uh, So this is what you actually put the boards in so you have the PCBs in a stack and it's kind of like a Pez dispenser All this machine does is like that's one job the one job it has is it takes those PCBs and just pops out one panel at a time into the next machine. And this machine is a stenciling machine. So it actually has uh, a stencil in it. And you can see like this bar here is a very uh, fine quality uh, squeegee. So just like a squeegee used to clean like your window with, except it's metal. Um, so it's like, it, it's perfectly flat. And um, this machine like uses a very, very powerful stepper motor to press it down against the stencil and squeegees that metal paste onto the PCBs. Okay, and then the PCB is like, yay, I've been squeegeed. And it comes down to the pick and place, which is like the super exciting part. So the pick and place, uh, it has all those feeders in it. Remember those feeders uh, from like 10 minutes ago that I showed you? So these are all the feeders. And um, so we have like, you know, a design might have anywhere from like three different feeders to up to 40 feeders, uh, which is actually not even that much, right? A cell phone probably has, you know, maybe 500 unique parts in it. Um, you know, they try their best to make it so it's uh, separated between multiple picking places, but you know, about, about 40 feeders might have to be done. And um, this uh, machine, basically what it does is it, is it has these uh, eight hydraulic nozzles and it goes down and it picks up eight components at a time and um, deposits them onto the pick and place. So here you can actually see this one is easier. This one has six nozzles. This is the first one I got and each of these nozzles uh, goes up and down and it can pick up a part so like you know this is a, a reel of a coin holders or something or chips or resistors or capacitors so it picks them up and then it places them and then there's this software that you run which is called like a job splitter and what it does is it takes your design like you know you panelize your circuit board and you're like okay I'm making cell phones or I'm making you know heart monitors and you tell it from your CAD software you import all of your component placements and then the software basically does like a super crazy version of the traveling salesman problem where it calculates what is the fastest possible configuration of picking up the parts and putting them to save you as much time as possible. So that program runs for like six hours. We only have to run it once. And then it will tell this machine, which is a somewhat stupid machine, it'll say, look, pick this part up and put it over there. So that's all good. So, you know, this is uh, pick and place number two. And there's a limit about how fast these can go because it is a very mechanical process. So even though you can get faster and faster picking places, it, at some point you do hit, hit a limit where it's like 
your hydraulics and mechanics, if you go any faster, they get inefficient. So you actually just get multiple pick and place. That's why I have two. They're like, why do you have two? Well, it's you want to get more speed, you just get two of them, and then one pick and place is half of it, and one pick and place is the other. Okay, this is a little inspection station here, which is where you know we just kind of look at the part and we have like a nice like image of like, hey, this is the thing you're making. Does it look like this thing? If it doesn't look like this thing, something went wrong. So stop the machine. Because until this point, you could actually fix problems, right? Because the stenciler and the pick and place, it's just the paste, and the, remember that metal paste is sticky, and it holds the component down, but it isn't permanent. Like you could take the parts off. It'd be kind of gross, but you could do it. But then you get to the part that's permanent, which is the oven. So this is just like that bagel toaster device that you have at the deli, and they put the bagel in, and it goes through, and then it kind of falls over, and it, you get it at the bottom, and it's like your bagel's nicely toasted. It's just like that. There's multiple heater zones, and it slowly heats them up. So I think this has like eight zones, and the first one maybe gets it to like, you know, 80 degrees C, and then it goes, you know, 100 degrees C, 120, 150, and then it goes all the way up to 240 degrees uh, Celsius, and then there's two cooling zones. And what that does is it uh, melts that paste down. So um, the solder paste that you had placed before, remember it's uh, these little solder balls, and they're in a sort of a flux uh, solution. Well, the flux burns off and is collected by the filter, and then all you get is this molten metal, which then uh, melts it. It melts at like 220. So at 240, it definitely like wets all the way down, all the components stick to the PCB, and your circuit board is done. So the good news about that mach those machines, the line, is they're very, very, very fast. It places about mm, 36,000 components per hour. Uh, this game is optimal. It's never that fast. But even at you know, not so optimal rates, is 10,000. Very, very, very fast, which is great, because you want to make things very fast. Um, but it only does surface mount components. It only does parts that sit on top of the PCB, which is why I try really, really hard to make all the parts be surface mount. Problem is not all parts are surface mount possible. Like they're not all available in surface mount. Um, connectors, because you need mechanical strength, um, surface mount components aren't very mechanically strong. So you know you have to have it go through the PCB and solder on both sides to get that mechanical strength. Um, sometimes you just have connectors that um, or components or chips that are older and like all you can get is through hole. That's why you use this machine. So this is the KISS 102, not to be confused with the KISS 108, which is the radio station that pays all your top hits. This is a selective solder machine. And this is super cool. Uh, these are rarer to find, but this is, um, I can't show it to you because it's, it's off. I can show you inside, but it's like there's nothing to see. There's basically a little nozzle, and there's a, a gigantic pot of like 500 pounds of molten solder. And the solder actually stays molten all the time because it takes so much energy to bring it up to temperature and, you know, and to bring it down. So it actually is always on. And that solder is in this gigantic like, tub, and it's, it's kind of well insulated. So once you get it up to that molten temperature of about 220 or whatever, 230, it stays molted, molted, melted. And then it has a very thin nozzle, and it squirts the solder up. And um, it will be able to through-hole solder components. So I'll just show you some quick through-hole solder components just to get you an idea of the kind of stuff it does. So, you know, uh, basically like, you know, headers that are through hole or like terminal blocks that are through hole. Anything has to go through the PCB. Um, I'm trying to think what else. There's mostly terminal blocks. Oh, it's like a, like a relay. Relays are rarely available in surface mount packages. So for through hole packages like this, you, you basically do what you can on the surface mount and then you bring it to the selective. And the selective does the rest of it. Ethernet jacks, um, little joysticks, also through hole. Basically, you know, lower cost parts. Honestly, in if you're manufacturing abroad, if you're going to like Shenzhen or China to manufacture, um, oftentimes it is cheaper just to have someone like hand solder. So some very low cost components will be unusually only available in through hole component rather than surface mount. So that's the tour of uh, the machinery, which is very exciting. And um, I want to show you some puppets. Got some cool puppets here. Uh, and then, sorry, uh, and uh, also some magazine covers I was on. This is, we have decoration here. Um, OK, so we're going to go to questions uh, shortly. Uh, you can ask me about the puppets. But before uh, I do that, I just want to ha have a present for you 
MIT students who are watching. So because this is Hack MIT, and it's an event where the MIT community celebrates making and hacking, and I love it, and I wouldn't be standing here in my open source hardware factory if it weren't for the making, hacking, and open culture that MIT students and the community are so well known for. So I want to help the next generation of students, and I want them to be free to hack on that hardware, software, medical devices, cars, whatever they want to. So I have an offer. If you, in your capacity as a student researcher at MIT, if you're asked by a company to sign a document or a contract agreement, or if you're asked to fill out a survey with personal information that could be used against you if you answer honestly, and it isn't 100% documented what the information is to be used for, I will personally pay my legal counsel to review it for you. And I'll post up a blog on the Adafruit site this weekend with more information. So that might be useful for you because this is the kind of stuff that you might get thrown at. And the people who write these contracts or documents, they have legal counsel and you may not. So I want to make sure that you have the opportunity to have somebody look at it. Uh, so that's my offer. So I'll, I'll blog about that with more information. So I can, you can see the PGP keys and email addresses you want. Um, and now I can take questions. So do you have any questions about manufacturing or testing or open source hardware? No? Well, I can't hear. Oh, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is why New York, given that the prices of like housing and like land there is really high? I'm, I'm sorry, I could, could you speak a little slow? So the, the question is why New York? Why is oh. your factory based in New York? That's a really good question. So um, when I first started uh, at MIT, um, I was actually kicking around and I was working at a startup there, but I ended up applying for an open source hardware fellowship here at, uh, in New York. And uh, it's called iBeam. So I did open source hardware and software as part of an art collective. And, you know, I kind of ended up sticking around here. I like, I like New York. It's a very exciting, energetic uh, city. It's some, sometimes actually being away from Boston or Cambridge is really good. Um, I'm kind of free to work on stuff here. And um, there's a lot of art and music and, like, people who are doing kind of interesting and weird stuff. And so... Um, for me, it's actually a really good city to be in. I really like it. And all of the equipment that I have is, is pretty small, so it actually doesn't matter where I am. And it's cheaper than San Francisco. <laughs> what first sparked your interest to look into electronics? So the question was, what first sparked your interest to look into electronics and hardware? You know, interesting, I actually wasn't really into electronics at all when I um, first went to school. Uh, I went to BU for a couple years, and I went to MIT, uh, and I did my MEng. And when I first went in, I was really into software. I liked programming. I thought, like, maybe I'd make video games or something. Um, but actually, a couple of the labs I took really got me interested in building hardware. It's, it's well, first off, your, your wrists hurt less because you don't get as much carpal tunnel because you're kind of doing other stuff. Um, so, you know, after, like, 6170, I was like, my, like, I felt like really like burnt out from doing software and I was like I want to do more hardware and what's really cool about hardware is you get to share it with people and it's like this physical thing that you can share and show and one thing I like about hardware is after you build it it works for a long time whereas with software I feel like you work on it and then like it stops working um, and you kind of spend all of your time maintaining it um, so like you know when I was um, at the media lab um, I did my thesis on um, making a cell phone jammer. I actually just wanted a cell phone jammer. I mean, like, who doesn't want to turn off people's cell phones remotely when they're being jerks on a cello or, like, you know, at Laverty's or whatever? So I would turn off um, people's, uh, this is actually my, my original prototype, which I kind of, like, hand solder together in the media lab. Um, and I thought that was really fun because, you know, you're building things that are outside the scope of what software can do. And other people really liked it also. I think, I think it's kind of fun and inspiring. I also think that, um, you know, custom hardware touches so many different um, expertises. So, like, whether you are, uh, you know, doing medicine or biology or chemistry or physics, you're probably going to have to build hardware or debug hardware. So it's, it's a useful, uh, you know, body of knowledge to be aware of and have fun with. Um, and it's also useful no matter what your long-term interests are, even if you're like, oh, I don't want to be a hardware engineer long-term. 
Also, you can turn off people's cell phones. I mean, come on. That's <laughs> So the question was, how much of your time do you spend hardware hacking versus doing entrepreneurial stuff versus outreach stuff? It's, it's kind of like one third, one third, one third. I, you know, I have a really good team of people. We have over 100 people here in the factory that do everything from you know, shipping and sales and manufacture to administration. And um, they're really, really good. And they do their job really well. And so I've empowered them to run a lot of the company that lets me do what I do best, right? which is I, I do hardware best. Um, and so the more time I have to design custom electronics, the better the company does. And um, kind of everything I do is, is outreach, right? So everything that we publish is open source. Um, you know, we have like 950 GitHub repos or something ridiculous. Uh, you know, we do a sponsorship of, uh, you know, Open Source Hardware Summit, which is coming up and events and we do we sponsor people to do workshops and we do videos like this all the time mm -hmm. um you know i just did a, a video for a bunch of uh of girls who are doing a coding camp um and i've also done other uh, video uh projects and outreaches so you know it's kind of all together it's like everything um not you know not every day do i get to plan to do hardware it's like you, you do kind of have to triage your day if it's a day where shoot you know i have to really spend time on uh, a presentation i'll do that but you know, carving out time to do hardware um, design is really important, so that's what I do. And I also mentor uh, the team of people here that do hardware with me, which is really fulfilling, because if you get to mentor and, and manage someone that does hardware for you, they do hardware when you're not able to do hardware, and then more hardware still exists, <laughs> which is just wonderful. Um, as, as one of the leaders of the Great Company, you know, you So the question is, as a leader of the maker movement, where do you see the movement and the community kind of going in the next five to 10 years? Well, I definitely see it's not, it's not gonna go away, right? So I think that, you know, it, it, it's like, I wanna say like, oh, the maker movement, but it really is something that people like to do anyways, right? Like you don't have to tell somebody about the maker movement to have them be really excited about Minecraft or, or building robots or rockets or, you know, like decking out their skateboard or making wearable fashion. Like people like to make stuff, right? Like that's kind of how we got here. Like we're humans got here because humans like to make things and be creative and like create technology. So I think, I think definitely think more people are going to do it. Um, I do see some really interesting things happening within the maker movement. So one is um, the accessibility and um, uh, like, uh, oh, hold on, I have a prop. Um, like accessibility technology. So accessibility technology, like this is a, a, an early demo. This is a 3D printed prosthetic. So, you know, there are a lot of people in the maker community like AT makers and other groups that work with kids or even adults that have special needs or they need, uh, you know, prosthetics or electronics or hardware to help them with their day-to-day -day lives. And, you know, when, uh, if, if you're someone who needs special hardware and you don't have that skill set, it can be very, very expensive and challenging to get that stuff made for you. But there's people in the maker community who are like, oh, you know, you just need a really big button that sends a keyboard press to your iPad and there's just nothing on earth that does that. Um, and so like, I'll make that for you. And so the ability to custom ha make hardware then, and, and that, ties together with open source hardware, right? If it isn't open source, it's not possible to do. So having open source hardware and have it be easy for people to customize it has allowed the accessibility, uh, accessible technology community really mesh well with the maker community, which I think is very interesting. And then I also have um, a lot of interest in IoT. So I think like, you know, there's, you know, you're definitely hearing a lot about IoT, right? But technology and sensors. So. The kind of sensor, you know, when I was an undergrad, which was like decades ago, um, if you wanted an accelerometer, it was single axis and it cost you 20 bucks and it was like a pain to get. Nowadays, that kind of sensor is 50 cents. I mean, it's like so cheap that you could put on anything or anything, which is kind of why you're seeing like accelerometer controlled toothbrushes, right? Because it's so cheap, you can put in anything. But I think that's also kind of interesting, right? Because we're now able to sense things and log things that we couldn't. So for example, there's a group here in the Bronx, uh, you know, up, upper Manhattan, and um, they're 
doing this research where they take low power radios with temperature sensors and they're putting them into um, the apartments of people who live in the Bronx who say, you know, their apartments are too hot to be lived in and their landlords won't do anything about it. Like they, they're re requesting air conditioning installation, but their landlords are like, no, it's not true. It doesn't get that hot. So they're actually using data loggers to prove that these apartments are getting hotter than uh, is reasonable for people to live in. So like that kind of sensor technology used to cost hundreds of dollars and now is like 10 bucks and you can put it together very easily. So I think IoT is very interesting. And I also think that um, like educational electronics is going really far. I think that, you know, one of the things that we talk about, we've talked about here at Adafruit is, um, you know, it, you, when you go to school, you learn a foreign language, but you're gonna have to learn a programming language as well. Like there's no question that every public school is eventually going to have, you know, require everyone to be able to know, you know, Python or C or, or Perl or whatever, some programming language or JavaScript. It, it's just gonna be a requirement for any job. And so I definitely see hardware uh, coming in and um, making it more fun than just like playing on a computer. I think like having uh, like wearable technology, like you know the micro bit or like the circuit playground that I designed or Arduino or Raspberry Pi, I think you're just gonna see that more and more um, in schools so that kids are going to be more exposed to hardware and building stuff. It's gonna be just like part of their curriculum, just like wood shop. <laughs> so someone wants to know about the puppets. Oh, yes. So we have uh, Adabot. So we have a, a puppet show. And um, these are the puppets. We have Adabot, who's kind of like Elmo for electronics. We have Minerva, who is kind of named after Athena. She's very wise. Uh, we also have um, these three LED puppets. There's uh, Gus, uh, Ruby, who's kind of young. Gus uh, sounds like Richard Feynman, has like a Brooklyn accent. Uh, Ruby, Billy, who's a blue LED. Um, and their, their mouths light up, which is kind of fun. We also have Mo back here, which is a resistor. Hey, Mo. Uh, Cappy the capacitor, Connie the transistor, and Hans the 555. <laughs> and, and this is, um, and you know, you're, kind of, you're like laughing. You're like, why do you have electronic puppets? But if you think about it, you know, um, a lot of kids do watch puppet shows or, or have seen like Sesame Street or similar, and they get, uh, they learn to be familiar with other concepts like mathematics or reading or science. And I thought it would be fun to do these videos. We do A through Z of electronics and we're up to like K's for kids. No, we do K for kids. J, K, L, M. We are up to M. And um, M is for MOSFET, which is the name of my cat also, who's gonna be guest starring. And um, the idea is that we have these short videos that go through like A is for ampere, B is for battery, C is for capacitor, and they teach a concept. And it's a little bit of the Sesame, trick, Sesame Street trick where even though it's for kids, it's actually for adults. Because there's actually a lot of adults that don't know what a battery is made out of either or what a capacitor is or what an ampere is or how a fuse works. So when we do these videos, they're kind of like funny and they're meant for kids, but they're also meant for just like adults who, are, who want a kid level introduction to these concepts. So they're kind of fun. Uh, you know, we do videos like every few months or so. We're gonna, we're gonna be filming the next ones shortly. And then we also have a, um, they're based off of a coloring book that uh, we have. It's a Creative Commons free downloadable coloring book. Um, they can just print it out. We have it on our website. And um, parents really like it because they print it out because, you know, they're, maybe they're engineers and their kids are like, what do you do at work? So they print out this coloring book and they can fill in little integrated chips, any color they want. You can color me in with my pink hair or, you know, whatever. Uh -huh. Me soldering or, or somebody using an oscilloscope. So they can draw whatever trace they want in the oscilloscope. So I think just getting people familiar with these words, that way, you know, when they do have to repair electronics or if they're interested in um, getting into electrical engineering or making, they're not like terrified of all these new words. So one person asked, um, oh, I can actually on that. Um, one person asked, uh, she's really impressed with how Adafruit is not only concerned with making electronics, but teaching, teaching electronics, and how you decided to kind of like shift towards that focus. 
to how to for shifting towards education, educating electronics, not just making electronics. Yep. You know, it, for me, it just seems like a natural thing to do. Like I think that, you know, I started by basically making kits, and when I made the kits, I'd take. You know, okay, so let's back up. When I first started making kits, um, electronic kits really sucked. Like they were, there's no like information about what you were building or how it worked or like what it was. The schematic wasn't like available. Um, you know, nothing was online. And so it was frustrating me because I wanted to build electronics. Like when I was in school, I was like, I want to build electronic kits, but there was like no information about what it was I was building or how to debug it. So, you know, I wanted to build kits that were not only useful, like you build something and you'd be like, hey, this is a useful thing that I just built, but also you learn something from it. Um, even if you weren't an engineer, maybe I would explain like one concept or something. So, you know, for example, um, this is like the first kit I worked on basically. So this is a synthesizer kit um, based on like the Roland TB303, which is a synthesizer that was discontinued and it was only like last year was reintroduced as like a classic retro synth. And, you know, we basically were, when I made this, there were other people who had made uh, derivatives or clones of the, the 303 synthesizer, but they never published anything, right? So like basically every four years, someone would come along and be like, hey, I'm gonna make the synthesizer. And then they would make it, never release any documentation about what they did. And then, you know, they would go away or go on vacation or just get tired of it. And they would never release anything. And then another couple of years would go by and someone would come by and be like, hey, I'm gonna start all over from scratch. And this just seemed like so ridiculous and stupid. Like why keep reinventing the, you know, this design over and over again. So, so when I worked on this, you know, we decided we were going to release everything we could and, um, you know, talk about how the design worked, publish all the source code and release it. And then, you know, as I was doing more kits like this, I realized people were more interested in the learning part. Like they wanted to not, cause you could just buy a synthesizer, right? Like why spend all the time making your own? Like that's a lot of time that takes away from playing video games or watching Netflix. So you have to have a good experience. You have to feel like after you finished building something that you learned and you, you, you feel like you're part of a new community, like you want to feel belonging to this maker movement or to the kind of person who can solder, right? So designing electronics, so like the, the electronics that I design is, is engineering, right? I, I do the engineering, I, I you know, do the differential equations and the Bode plots and, and trace impedances, whatever. And that part's interesting, but the more interesting part to me that's harder is how can I take that very complicated engineering and explain it to anyone, make it available to anyone in the world so that they're both interested and maybe they learn something, but then also the project doesn't die, right? Because it, there's enough people who are interested in it that will continue and um, maybe even improve on the project, right? So people uh, do GitHub push, pull requests on my code. I make mistakes, or maybe I didn't add a feature. So they will do a pull request, or people will take designs that I've made and then remix them and start a company, or maybe do a Kickstarter, or maybe just take it to Burning Man. And that's cool. That's kind of the point. That's what I want to see, right? Why reinvent all of this hardware over and over and over again? I think that answered your question. So the question is, how do you deal with gender stereotypes? Do you think some people might not take you as seriously as a woman? And how do you deal with that? Oh, you just like kick their ass. I mean, like, that's easy, right? Like, you just do a five times better job. And it doesn't matter if they take you seriously. In fact, you should be happy because being underestimated is the best gift anyone can give you, right? Because then you're free. You're free to do whatever you want without any expectations. And so you can do whatever you want. And that's why I kind of started my own company, right? Because like I can now fulfill any expectations I want. And if people have expectations, it doesn't matter. I'll do whatever I want to do. And I'll just keep putting them out of business if they keep underestimating me. <laughs> Um, so the question is, what kind of challenges did you face when starting a hardware company, especially in an age where kind of software company is dominating? Well, software companies have always dominated. So don't, I mean, like there hasn't been hardware dominating the industry until like 1960s, right? It's been, it's been a long time. So, uh, 
you know, it's always going to be a challenge. But when you're thinking of like, you want to do a company. So one of the most foolish things you can do is say, well, what's the easiest option, right? The easiest option is software because, oh, you know, software, you just get some people in a room and they type and, you know, like you have a product. But the problem is, is that that may be true for, if you just have to solve a problem, yes, I agree. You know, you're like, I have a problem to solve in my organization. Should I pick the hardware that's the easy way? Fine. But if you're actually starting a company, going with the easiest solution is not a good idea because if it's going to be the best solution. Because when you create a company, the most important thing you want to do to maintain like solvency and stay in business is create moats, right? And this, this concept of a moat is like, as in like a body of water, like you know, dragons in it and like crocodiles and stuff. So the bigger your moat, the better chance you have of surviving because nobody gets to cross that moat. So you want to have a really big moat with lots of like angry animals inside of it. And everything you do that's very challenging that other people can't do, but that you can do because you have the skills to do it, makes your moat bigger, right? So if, you're, if, you have a way to, if you have a company that you want to do that's software, the risk is because it was so easy for you to do it in software, anybody else can come in and do it with software also very easily, right? That's why everyone's like, oh, man, like, I'll just make an Instagram clone. No big deal. Like, how long could it possibly take? And they'll, they'll actually start and do that, whereas, like, nobody's interested in making an Adafruit competitor because it, it looks like it sucks, right? It's just, you're just dealing with, like, things all the time. Like, there's, there's parts, and the parts are physical, and you have to order them, and they ship here, and then they show up, and then the, the, you have to unpackage them and put them in a picking place, right? But the, all those things are not, like, downers. They're actually, like, good things. They're moats. So they're things that make it very hard for anybody to get into the space and compete with you as a company. Now, whether it actually solves the problem you want to solve, I don't know. Like, that's up to you to decide. But you shouldn't just pick the easy thing because it's easy, right? Like, it, it's not, that isn't going to make it easier for you to run a company. Does that make sense? So the question is, how did you choose the first people to join your company? Um, the first people to join our company, well, first, the first people who really helped out were just like MIT friends. Uh, you know, they were like bored or unemployed or they just wanted to like hang out. And so like we did some projects together. Um, you know, that's, that's a really common thing to do, hire from within your friend community. And that's actually, by the way, the secret of MIT is that's actually the reason you go to MIT, right? The course is you could just take it online. Right? No biggie. You can open up a calculus textbook. Calculus is calculus. Hasn't changed in like 100 years, right? So why are you paying so much money to calculus? The reason you're paying so much money to calculus is uh, because you're going to meet all these people around you that are going to help you when you want to start a company, right? That's actually kind of the whole point of Hack MIT. I don't know if you guys have figured that out yet, but that's kind of what, they're, what you're there for, right? Is to meet people that you might want to start businesses with or, or go into uh, other ventures with. Maybe you want to start an NGO or a nonprofit or whatever. Um, so that's kind of the first place you're gonna you're gonna find people. Um, other places is uh, you can, you know, well it didn't exist at the time, but I would call now a hacker space or a maker space if you're part of one. Uh, that's kind of where we got our first people. It's people who are on mailing list for hackers and makers here in New York, and we hired people from there. So that, that was kind of where we first got started with people. I'm going to now back up. Back to my desk. These are the last questions. The question is, what is the t-shirt all about? What is this t-shirt? <laughs> this is my Course 6 t-shirt. So there, I know there's some people who don't go to, to MIT. Um, but this is, um, sorry, uh, this is uh, the MIT t-shirt for people who like to be science. This is a uh, frequency, 6 hertz. And this is the back, 6 bytes. And <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little bit about how unpleasant it is to take computer science at MIT. <laughs> <laughs> It's a long question. <laughs> I'm scared.
Okay, what was that question? Uh, <laughs> so what is the question? Why open source? Okay. Um, so the question is kind of like wondering about um, how open source plays into like, um, like kind of like having competitors in your space. So like, does like open sourcing things make it easier for your competitors to kind of like, like copy things? Like, I'm sure there's a lot of like knockoff Adafruit products as well. And like, how do you kind of deal with that? Well, there's there's going to be. Um, but here's the thing about hardware. So. With hardware, you can just look at it, right? So there is actually no protection you have. I mean, like, we were able to reverse engineer that synthesizer without having any official open source documentation, right? We just opened up the synthesizer and traced out all the components. So, you know, like, that's not really going to stop anybody. And the benefit you get from having open source is that the community then can, like, do stuff and they can be, they can feel like they're part of the community and they can contribute back. So I don't think that like open sourcing stops anybody from making clones or variants of Adafruit stuff. So if I'm going to do it, I might as well benefit the community rather than trying to have some sort of collective punishment where it's like, oh, because someone out there, you know, might be or is cloning something I'm doing, uh, you know, for that reason, I'm not going to release a documentation, right? Because that, that doesn't help anybody. It only like, you know, makes maybe me feel better, but it doesn't actually feel make me feel better because I know that I can send any hardware to, like there's multiple companies both here and in China. You send them hardware and you tell them reverse engineer it and a month later you get the schematic, the, you know, layout, all the documentation that they have. They'll even maybe get the firmware out for you. So, you know, for me, like I would prefer to just have open culture and like open source and release anything so that you, if you're working on your hack MIT project and you're like maybe wanting to build a motor controller and you don't want to start from scratch, you can look at what I've done and you think like, well, you know, she did sell like 100,000 of them. This design probably works okay. I don't have to start all over again. Like I said, like what's the point of that? And you can get for, oh, you can move forward and actually work on the project you want to work on rather than like messing around with power supplies or, you know, how thick to make the traces for your motor driver. So I think that's all we have time for today. Um, hey. OK, let's one last question. I'm hiring. <laughs> the question is, do you hire interns? We, we don't hire interns. Um, but what we do do is we hire from the community. So for example, we have a show and tell. It's something that we run uh, every Wednesday, 7.30 PM Eastern time. And it's a half an hour where people from like anywhere around the world, like really anywhere, like we've got like every continent. Uh, they show up and they show off their project. Like, what are they working on and what are they building? And so far, we've hired like five people uh, to be creative engineers from the show and tell. People who've shown up and shown off some really cool projects. And they don't have to use our stuff. They're just making really cool stuff. And we're like, wow, your design skills, your engineering is really interesting. And we see a lot of potential for working together. And then we hire those people. And, and some of our best projects and work have come from those collaborations. So that's. That's kind of what we do instead of like an internship pro uh, program. All right, everyone, let's give a more round of applause. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. Cool. And if you have more questions, yeah, I have a, a we have a weekly show. So 7.30 was a show and tell, but 8 p.m. on every Wednesday, we have Ask Engineer. And I'm the engineer. And you can show up. And if you have other questions, you can ask questions for me there. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>